the challenge, the opportunity to connect. The 1960s, a time of imagination and change, a time of anger and fear. The 1960s, a program called Challenge. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Looked at our connections, our divisions, through the lens of faith. Nearly 60 years later, during these challenging times, we'll take a new look at our divisions, our connections, in a new program called Challenge 2.0. The former U.S. Surgeon General believes our country is suffering from an epidemic of loneliness. Dr. Vivek Murthy said the evidence pointed to such an epidemic long before the isolation created by the COVID pandemic, and that such loneliness not only causes emotional problems, but also physical ones. A Brigham Young University study says the health impact of chronic loneliness is equivalent to smoking 15 cigarettes a day. In this episode of Challenge 2.0, then, we turn to the Interfaith Amigos for thoughts on what we can and should do for ourselves and for each other. So we are delighted to be in studio. Let me first introduce our guests, uh, most of whom, all of whom, you've probably seen on Challenge 2.0 before. Rabbi Olivier ben Chaim from uh, Bet Aleph Meditative Synagogue and uh, Imam Jamal Rahman. Uh, Northwest Interfaith Amigos and Pastor Dave Brown, also of Northwest Interfaith Amigos. Uh, as I said, we've done programs via Zoom, as everybody's been doing Zoom, but it's so nice to just be in studio, be in reaching length of each of you. Thank you so much for joining us for this. Thank you. Yeah, it's wonderful to be here. Thank you for having us and for your steadfast work in keeping this program going. Uh, well, it's needed, and I think the topic that we're doing today, of course, when you hear loneliness, I think our immediate association is the pandemic and how people were separated from each other and isolated, but in an even longer view than that, what is your experience of loneliness within your faith communities? Also beyond that, and do you agree that it's, as the Surgeon General, former Surgeon General said, it's reaching epidemic proportions, whichever one of you would like to tackle that first? I've seen loneliness growing uh, well before the pandemic, and I think we may miss some um, important data points if we simply say, well, the pandemic happened and people became lonely. Mm -hmm. um, I saw the, as people retreat to a life with a little screen that occupies their time and stops them from being out and being present in community. Mm -hmm. I think the um, fact of, uh, in faith communities, they are so often polarized that people don't always feel comfortable going there to find other people to journey uh, with. Mm -hmm. And conversely, uh, since the pandemic, I have heard of people going back to faith communities, not because they miss spiritual practice or brilliant teaching and preaching, but because they miss the community and that's the one place where they could find it. Mm -hmm. Well, I, w I want to just echo what you're saying that uh, it's been a grave problem, loneliness, mm -hmm. before the pandemic, but the pandemic has exacerbated it. And you know, uh, if you analyze it, the, the great sages say there are two main reasons. One is that um, there is a sort of a misdefinition of one's identity. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm just focused on my personality, the I, 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 me, me, me. I miss out on my divine spark. Mm -hmm. So there's a big void in my life. That's one. And then secondly, uh, you know, we've been told that the definition of success is more money, more titles, mm -hmm. and those things never end. And there's a constant struggle to survive or to flourish. Mm -hmm. And that leads us to living a life of what is called quiet desperation. Mm -hmm. So that void, that void we have, inner void, and that struggle for uh, you know, riches and titles gives us this life of quiet desperation. That makes for a terrible loneliness. Mm -hmm. Olivier, what's been your experience with that? Um, I'm glad that um, you mentioned that it was you know, really before the pandemic, but the pandemic kind of brought it, um, you know, in, in more sharper focus. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what we are seeing in, in, in our community is mostly people who live alone, um, uh, uh, more elderly people. Mm -hmm. There's a real deep sense of feeling ostracized and left out of, 
of life. I mean, it's already very hard for anyone of a certain age to be included in American society because there is this kind of a uh, rejection of the elderly as as the as as the very you know very concept of our our American society, which mm -hmm. is all about youthfulness and 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 participating in the in in the economy. So there's already this 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 trend that uh, after a certain age you just pushed to the sides and you know with with a world that is moving more and more online mm -hmm. um, where especially for the elderly the the technology is not easy to navigate or understand mm -hmm. um, it's it's really drawing a, a wider chasm uh, and, and 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 pushing people to extreme loneliness that's what uh, we have seen in our community specifically you brought up a point when you said in American society, and I was interested just trying to get a handle on this and do some research beforehand, that there was evidence that suggested loneliness is a much greater problem in the United States than it is in other countries. Do you agree with that? And you sort of touched on some of the reasons for that, but I'd like you to sort of expand on that. I, I'm not a American born, and so I lived in different countries. I lived in France, where I was born and grew up, and I lived in Israel. And in, in those countries, the, the life happens really on, on the streets. Life happens in, in your neighborhood. Um, you, you, you know all of your uh, little retailers, you know, the mom, moms and pops little retailers that, that have been part of your, of your life every day, you know. I, I, one of the, one of the, shock that I had when I came to America is that everybody here has a huge freezer in their homes. Mm -hmm. in, in Europe, in France, where I grew up, or in Israel, you buy your food on, on a daily basis. You don't need freezer, before, maybe for ice cubes, you know, to drink with your, with, with, with your aperitif, like we say. Uh, so the, 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 the li life, life in Europe I mean, in France and in Israel, is a w it's a life where you walk everywhere as well, mm -hmm. where you you know your neighbors, you know your the merchants in your little in, in your neighborhood, and there is this sense of being part of a little village, even if you live in a huge city, because your neighborhood is really unique to you. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't matter if you live in Paris or in a little village in in the Provence in France. You know. You, this is there's a there's a community there is a village around you, and th I think this is lost here in the U.S. The way uh, the way we live we we live in our cars we commute everywhere. Um, one of the jokes that was running in my family when uh, at the time we we lived in uh, in New Jersey uh, from from my my mother was like, you know, she asked, you know, can we get a, a you know a little butter or something because we were missing something at home. And I said, yeah, sure, it's just down the street. Let's get in the car. And it was a 45-minute drive back and forth to the store and back. And my, my mother was just stunned, you know, because in, in Europe, you want a little thing of butter. You go down the stairs, you get it, and you go back upstairs, <laughs> you know. But also when I'm in New York City, uh, where we have a, sure. a very part-time apartment, that area where we live between 9th and 10th in, in Chelsea, uh, um, on, um, we walk down the street and we nod. We know people, even if we're only there for a month a year. We walk to, you know, there's half a dozen places between 25th Street and 24th Street on 10th where I can get butter. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there are, you know, the local people in coffee shops and pubs. So. I think people make choices to be in those cities, to be maybe like in Europe, but to fight loneliness. Mm -hmm. Another source of loneliness, depression, quiet desperation is the way we define ourselves mm -hmm. and define you. We are focused more on the outer reality. Uh, I judge you, I judge myself. How much uh, money do I have? What is my status? Uh, what kind of job do I have? I miss out, uh, something you mentioned, uh, both of you, on the inner reality, what is my capacity to be loving, to be compassionate, to be gracious, to be of service? So when we have that outlook, life becomes a constant struggle. Uh, you, you mentioned American, um, you know, the, the, the system here, you know, the competition mm -hmm. to be number one, to reach the top. It's like climbing a ladder and I step on everybody to reach the top. Mm -hmm. I forget that when I'm coming down, I'll meet those same people. <laughs> and and, uh, and that's a, a very lonely struggle mm -hmm. 
to be in that position. So it's really, it's also, uh, besides not having a community, what is called a circle of love, it's also a spiritual issue of how we define ourselves, how we define the purpose of life. In preparing for this, in addition to looking at the overall statistics on loneliness, there were also connections that have been drawn between loneliness, depression, and even suicide, yes. and uh, particularly among young people. And the interesting aspect, I mean, that's upsetting, but the interesting and also disturbing aspect, if it said that uh, depression and suicide seems to be rising in incidence among young people in this country, while it seems to be decreasing among young people in other countries. What's your reaction to that, and what, what does that point out as part of the problem and perhaps part of the solution? Well, I'm certainly not um, a scientist that has research data about mm -hmm. this. Uh, my sense is that over the 40 years of my, of my ministry, I've witnessed uh, the change in family, the diminishment of voluntary communities like faith communities, mm -hmm. where a young person has a sense that they're loved unconditionally, not just by those that have to because they're their family. Mm -hmm. and, and so I think the young person whose you know, families shift their form, movement across the country is much more common. When I grew up in, in New Jersey, um, my aunt who lived in Arizona was sort of the eccentric one who chose not to live in Jersey. Now, uh, you run into people all the time, their families are all across the country. I mm -hmm. think that has changed significantly in the last 40 or 50 years. I think the decline in, in faith communities, and we all know those familiar statistics of um, so you don't have a place where a young person can go and connect to somebody that cares about them um, when, they're, when they're in trouble. Mm -hmm. uh, so I do think we've seen kind of intentional support communities dissolve, plus media allowing the echo, echo chamber to get a message in that lonely person's head that, that you know, you're alone and they're wrong. Mm -hmm. And then maybe a third thing that may be beyond this is a diminishment of, of empathy. Mm -hmm. So we don't feel for other people when we're disconnected from them, and it, it can lead to some deadly consequences. Mm -hmm. It's a very serious problem, if I may just say uh, something about it, because um, there's a lot of research on this, mm -hmm. that the second highest rate of suicide among young people, uh, 10 to 24, and uh, 25 to 35, is suicide. Mm -hmm. And the research in the high schools, you know, what is the problem here? So they asked the uh, young boys, uh, who is the most popular among you? What do you aspire to be? Or, mm -hmm. And it is usually an athlete or somebody who, shall I say, scores with women. Mm -hmm. And they asked the young girls, you have to look a certain way. And particularly the, the, the emphasis, the uh, pressure to lose weight mm -hmm. is so toxic. Then among the young adults, even some of the you know, middle-aged adults, the same problem about uh, you know, running after money and titles mm -hmm. and power. But that was one aspect. The other aspect was they found that among the young people, uh, in one particular high school, they did, a, they did a very serious research in a sort of a, uh, affluent neighborhood. 85% were vulnerable, had suicidal thoughts. 15% did not have suicidal thoughts. Mm -hmm. And who were they? They were actually associated with some, some religious center could be mm -hmm. a church, a synagogue, a mosque, a temple, not so much because of theology, but because number one, they felt welcomed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They felt welcomed, they were visible. And number two, they had some spiritual practices to fall back on, mm -hmm. to deal with anxiety, to deal with anger, uh, you know, uh, to deal with uh, overcoming some uh, issue they might have within themselves. Some call it spiritual practices, psychological practices, but they had some practices Mm -hmm. within themselves they could use. And that is another factor. If we are throwing away the institution of religion because it's a problem, you know, they're focused on recruiting and fundraising, we don't want to throw, what is the English expression, the baby with the bathwater. Mm -hmm. We need those practices to become a more complete human being. We need community and to feel welcome. Well, I think um, there, there's a couple of things that I was, uh, I was just being uh, present to. You know, the, the the ages that you mentioned, you know, 15 to 35, those are really tender times. You know, all of us, as as we all remember, those, those are really the, the decades where 
we evolve and seek to find who we are. You know, there's this great inner search for how do we define ourselves, who, 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 do, we, who do we aspire to be, and it, it's, this, this, this time is really challenging because, um, I mean, what we're, we're, we're watching uh, a kind of a social uh, interaction that is based on those devices that, uh, that you mentioned earlier where everybody lives a, a, a kind of a fake life mm -hmm. uh, online where you are um, asked to or you are pushed to uh, project to the world a life that is all perfectly beautiful and everybody's always having great time and you know so and and so you are in this space where you are invited to only look at or only pretend to be that joyful uh, person who has it all together mm -hmm. and we and we lose in this uh, or or we create in doing this a, a sense of 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 um, a world that is fake and and youth especially when you're looking to define who you are to be thrown into a world that has no real bearing on reality where everything is pr a projection of a, of a certain kind of image out to the world mm -hmm. and we are losing the inwardness we're losing the ability to say well no i'm not having a great day today or you know you will never find on instagram and of all of the social media anyone posting something about how terrible life is for them i mean it's very rare and 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 so that speaks of a, a certain disconnect between uh, our, our, our true human nature when you are wrestling with finding who you are and this, this, um, this push to really just uh, show up a facade, mm -hmm. uh, an illusory facade, which the ego really feeds on, uh, but, but there, it's so fragile. And, it, and, and when that comes down, when, the, when, when that illusory facade comes down, I believe you find a lot of, you know, the rates of suicide go up. You know, Rumi has a wonderful um, uh, verse on that. He says, you know, in our lives, we wear so many masks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Please take off that mask because your real face is so beautiful. Right. If only you knew. Right. Religion, all religious traditions, apart from arguments about truth claims, do provide belonging, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. intergenerational connection. Mm -hmm. True, it, this is a value statement, true faith communities ask the question, what does it mean to be human? Mm -hmm. How do I relate to other humans? Is there something more? And so as we see the institutions where those questions decline in American public life and the connections that happened in them, is anything there to take their place? Mm -hmm. What will that be? Some might say, well, the coffee shop or the brew pub or the, you know, or the, the local dog walking place where you meet up with other people. Mm -hmm. But where do people make the connections that they used to make in faith communities? And to be very clear, I recognize why it may be a good thing to see religion decline because of the polarization that so many religious traditions feed in our country. Mm -hmm but we need to recognize something is lost mm -hmm. in human life when you don't have those traditions. Yeah, I think that one of the, one of the, the key aspects of what spiritual communities have to offer is, is this sense of, um, of transcendence mm -hmm. as well. This, um, this, I mean, I, I'm hearing you talk about people meeting in a dog park or a mm -hmm. coffee shop or things like that, and you might have, you know, very good friends that can ha handle deep and meaningful conversations. But I think that in the context of a religious community or a spiritual community, you are more invited to have those deeper, more meaningful conversations, mm -hmm. things that are going to be thought-provoking, things that are going to challenge maybe your, your view of what it means to be a human being. Mm -hmm. But especially, I think, in the deeper, more, more spiritual communities, there is this invitation of, uh, of, of awakening beyond separateness. Mm -hmm. and, and one of the things that alienates us is this notion of separateness. Mm -hmm. and, and deep spiritual theologies and practices will point out the oneness that, that is everything mm -hmm. and that we are part of a totality and not isolated little islands lost in the ocean of life. Mm -hmm. That we're in fact all part together of an evolution of humanity as a 
as, as we specifically in the Kabbalistic uh, framework uh, that we are participating in. We are participating in the evolution of, of humanity, of, of earth, of the universe into toward more and more oneness and inclusiveness and embrace. And I think this message is being lost in, in, in uh, uh, outside of those spiritual, deep spiritual communities. And, 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 and because of that, I think we are losing that message that you and I are, maybe we look different, we, we love differently, we pray differently, we speak differently, but ultimately all of us are each beautiful expressions of that one presence, that one being that we all belong to. That's the ultimate aspect of belonging. And I think that's a very powerful message that can sustain and support people when they feel more and more uh, isolated and, and the pursuit of of the individualistic uh, happiness, whatever that I ever is, this mirage that we're seemingly all running after. But, but Olivia, I want to say one yes. thing. The institution of religion is doing just the opposite of that. The institution, that's why I mentioned yes, the spiritual yes, yes. communities. I mean, this sense of exclusivity, mm. this focus on theology, right. which is why young people are leaving, a lot of elderly people are also leaving, those who don't have vested interests. But that is why, but still, the institution of religion can be helpful because there's some practices that goes beyond religion, meaning just practicing silence, for example. Mm -hmm. There's no such thing as a Jewish silence, Christian <laughs> silence, Muslim silence. It's just silence. And you know, all the sages have said, psychologists, psychiatrists, people who know, that if, regardless of your politics or religion, if we truly sat down and practiced even just regular silence, mm -hmm. things would change. That would be a strong, powerful, spiritual practice. And, w and where I just, I'm so excited hearing my two brothers talk about this. It's because I feel one of the reasons religion may be declining, it's not just the more conservative folks that have become the Republican Party of prayer, but within at least the Christian household, so many of Christian denominations have become so concerned with justice issues, which are critical, uh, and with engaging in, 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 in the struggle to save the planet and uh, working for all forms of equality, which are crucial and I spent my life on, but they've lost the spiritual core behind it. Even good liberal churches have become the Democratic Party at prayer, mm -hmm. uh, rather than a place where unity beyond issues is explored and experienced. So this, thank you both for what you said. There has been the suggestion that the quality of our relationship with others is influenced by the quality of our relationship with ourselves. You each have suggested different aspects on that. What do you think we need to do to improve that quality with ourselves and therefore help that with others? You know, the sages have said, I, I always quote that 13th century sage Rumi because I studied Rumi in tandem with the Quran. He says, the leaves and the branches, they grow according to the root. Mm -hmm. The root here is my relationship with myself. Mm -hmm. If I don't have a relationship with myself, if I don't love myself, I can learn the mechanics of relating to you, of loving you, saying beautiful things, but it's weak roots within me. Mm -hmm. Which is why, you know, even if I look outside of my own religion, if I look at Taoism, there's a wonderful verse in Taoism that says, that says, compassionate towards yourself, you reconcile all beings in the world. Mm -hmm. If I want compassion in the world, in my family, extended family, in my country, in, in the world, the first step and the most important step is, can I be gentle and compassionate with myself? Mm -hmm. And that, by the way, is the core of Islam. Uh, you know, compassion is the core uh, teaching of Islam. I'm not saying Muslims practice that, but the key is to start that, build the root, the groundwork with myself. Everything else is a reflection of that. Yeah, Judaism obviously echoes this. I can quote from Leviticus, you know, love your neighbor as yourself. Um, in this verse, very well-known verse, um, is the injunction to love yourself. Because how are you going to love your neighbor uh, if you don't have love for yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think the, the beginning of, of any spiritual or religious practice is to, st is to start with uh, a process of opening our heart, mm -hmm. opening our heart 
not just to what is outside of ourselves, but opening our heart to our heart, to our own uh, uh, inner being, to our own self. Uh, and and this, um, this, this quest uh, is, as, is also lost because, again, we, sh we look for validation or on the outside. We look for appreciation on the outside. We look for others to tell us if we're doing okay or if we're not doing okay. And there's never this, this, um, this mirror that we actually need to hold in front of ourselves to see, okay, just as I am, mm -hmm. just as I am, which is really challenging and really hard, but just as I am, can I love who I am as I am right now in the totality of who I am? When we're able to do that, that kindness, that compassion has been underscored that what each of you have been talking about in terms of addressing this, but also exemplified by each of you. So I thank you each very much, and I thank each of you for joining us on this week's edition of Challenge 2.0, and you're going to see these same three gentlemen next week, so we hope you'll join us again. Thank you. If you've enjoyed this program, found our conversations to be informative, entertaining, and thought-provoking, and the vision inspiring of people from different backgrounds who can disagree without being disagreeable, perhaps you might consider supporting our program with a contribution. Your support will not only help our program continue, it will also support the broader efforts of Paths to Understanding, our supporting parent nonprofit organization.